I'm going to go straight on to the first question. What we've done is we've uh, taken uh, questions via emails, we've had questions sent uh, directly to 38 degrees, we've had questions this evening have arrived in as well. We've grouped them under three headings. Um, the first one we're going to uh, have is, I'll just stand up because I can't see people at the back. Can you hear me okay at the back? You're good, aren't you? Lovely. Uh, the first area of questions we're going to talk about is quality of life questions. And we're going to start off with one question, which is a broad picture, and uh, the candidates will have their two minutes. And then we'll follow that with two or three questions read out together. And the candidates will again have two minutes to pick and choose and respond to those questions as, as they wish. Um, the second topic that we'll come to will be around democracy. And the third topic, uh, future proof. Uh, which is broader issues that will affect the future, of course. I will do my best to slip in the additional questions that people have brought uh, in as they came through, but if I don't manage to fit them all in, we'll, we'll do as many as we can later on. We have uh, tailored some of the questions because there were so many, so questions that seemed more appropriate for councillors, we have generally left them lower priority. And sometimes we've combined a couple of questions. We've also tried to make sure that the questions are written in a way that isn't focused on a specific policy or a specific government, uh, sorry, a specific party, uh, so that it's a, it's a challenge to all of the candidates to respond and, and show their best in the situation. So if I could start with the, the first uh, <coughs> group of questions, which is on quality of life. And you might want to take notes because they are quite debatey. Um, the first question is uh, that our public services are under severe stress. Uh, teachers, probation officers, doctors and others are considering leaving at the earliest opportunity. One question submitted raises the issue of the nationwide shortage of general practitioners and as it takes 10 years to train a GP, it, what is your party thinking of doing to fill the gap? Similarly, another question, um, what would you do to address the current crisis with retaining teachers? Bound by a test fixated ethos and obsession with teacher scrutiny, as up to 40% of newly qualified teachers leave within their first year and we face increasing pupil numbers. Now we're going to, you, you'll have two minutes each again to respond and I'll just mention 30 seconds or 10 seconds when we get there. Um, and we'll follow the same order, but we'll start this time. We will start one person further down each time. So, David, would you like to start off? And once everybody has had their two minutes, David will get an extra minute to add any further comments he wishes. David. Public service is under. Can you hear me without the microphone? No. Public service is under under increasing stress. Um, well, hardly surprising given the, the cutbacks which we have seen over the last five years, which um, a large part of which obviously has been um, as a result of tax cuts being given to those who don't really need them. I mean, I think, I th I think it, in times when times are tough, um, those with the broadest shoulders have to bear the greatest load. And I don't think that giving tax cuts um, to the wealthiest I don't think giving tax cuts to companies is a sensible way of dealing with um, how we provide the public services which everybody wants. Um, and it, you know, obviously it ranges all the way through from hospitals to um, grass cutting. Um, so the Labour Party's approach to, to this is um, whilst, we, whilst we're under such financial strains, is that we would do things like reverse the tax cut which was given to the wealthiest. We will <coughs> not proceed with corporation tax cuts. We will tackle uh, non-payment of tax by people like the non-DOMs and by the, the multinationals who channel their income away from, from England in order to, to avoid paying fair taxes. That gives us greater leeway to deal with the problems in, in public services. 30 um, seconds, David. I mean, one problem with GPs is that the body which plans um, for the future in terms of what's needed in doctors was abolished. So we don't currently have a system which plans for that. That's the sort of thing which is, is um, simply uh, ineffective 
I mean, it might save you some money, but ultimately five years or ten years down the line, you've lost your GPs. That's teachers, we need, to re we, we need to restore faith in our teaching profession. We need to recognise that teachers are a profession as much as doctors, as much as nurses, as much as lawyers. They are important. They, are, they should be valued. Um, when people say it to my sister, who's a teacher, oh, well, you get 13 weeks holidays, you're fine. <coughs> Drives her mad because people just don't realise how hard teachers work in the class and at home. Thank you, David. We've got to value them. Thank you very much. Uh, could we... <coughs> excuse me. Could we next have, please, David Meacock? You could. Uh, thank you very much. Um, public services under stress. Well, part of this, and in fact, the foundation of it, is a numbers issue. I heard in the, re in the news recently that last year there were 370 million GP appointments. It's difficult to picture that, isn't it? Because it's difficult to picture it's just 1 million, never mind 370. But the punchline is there are only 300 the year before. Now, no service, especially the front line of that service, is sustainable with a 25% increase in demand from one year to the next. The problem that we've got is that we haven't planned for the massive demands on public services. And at the root of that is that since 1997, during the, La the Labour administration, we had seven million immigrants come into this country. And during the last coalition, we've had two million. Now, that's a huge increase, particularly if you think that in the 1970s, when I was still in short trousers at school, there was a debate in Parliament as to whether the UK could stomach 28,000 immigrants and migrants in one year. Well, last year, to give you the net figure, we actually had 298,000, which of course has caused huge demand on our, on our public services. And that, of course, is in contravention of David Cameron's promise, which he's had five years to fulfil and failed to reduce net uh, migration to the tens of thousands with a tail piece at the end of that contract, if you remember, which seconds, said, if you don't, if, if uh, we haven't succeeded, uh, then vote us out. <coughs> so um, in terms of the, the uh, teacher crisis that we've talked about, well, one way that we could reduce um, bureaucracy is that UKIP will scrap the primary school tests. I mean, children are just so diverse at that age. Ten I don't seconds. really think primary school tests are, are very meaningful. Uh, in terms of getting rid of the uh, ev evasion of tax, by exiting the EU, companies who trade in the UK could no longer choose which company is the most advantageous for them to pay tax in. So that would be a real way that we could actually get that back. Thank I think you. I'm probably out of time now. So. <laughs> you are. Thank you very much. <coughs> Steve Guy lib <-Libden. coughs> okay. Well, money is part of it, but it's, it is only part of it. So, yes, public services, uh, like every every sort of government department has, has had to field a pinch over the last five years and that's because when the coalition government began in 2010 we had an economic mess we had a huge deficit um, which had, has to be reduced because otherwise all that happens is that a quarter of the money that you pay in tax goes to pay interest on the money that we've already borrowed so we have to sort that out and that does make it painful for everybody um, I don't uh, subscribe to the view that it's the rise in our population that in itself is the problem. I don't subscribe to the view either that the rise in the number of GP appointments is, is a problem. In fact, there's a, a school of thought within medicine that, that you know not enough of us are going to GPs. And one of the reasons why cancer outcomes in Europe are better than they are in Britain is because people in Europe are more inclined to go to the GP uh, at the first sign of problems than we are. Um, so we do need more doctors, of course we need more doctors. And we have provided actually more doctors under this government. Um, teaching is an interesting one because um, I, I do think that successive governments and politicians have, have heaped a lot of, of pressure on teachers. They, every government comes in and wants to make big reorganisations and changes. And, and I think teachers get sick of it and they are uh, a, a very important group of people in our society because they're shaping uh, the next generation and then they're, they're not sufficiently valued and I think we do need a cultural shift where we value good teachers more and, and give them more respect for what they they do and give them more support. Thank you very much. 
And now we come to Stephen Baker, Conservative, please. You know, I think High Wycombe's a great place to live. It's well positioned in our country. It's got plenty of work. It's got plenty of recreations and it's a brilliant place to be and that is a good start with quality of life. I mean, of course, things have been tough because we had a dreadful inheritance. We had a record peacetime deficit, which we've cut in half as a proportion of GDP. We were very helpfully left a note saying there's no money left. Now, that was not funny. Um, there was no money left and we've had to turn the country around. We're well on the way to doing that. We, in the end, it's become a bit of a cliche. You can't have a strong, uh, a pub, good public services without a strong economy. It's absolutely true. You've got to have the money to spend to support these things. I think the question was really about how do we keep people in these professions and encourage them and make sure that they can enjoy their lives. Well, that is, of course, what we want. We all want people to be able to enjoy their lives. With teachers, I'd like our academy freedoms to be carried further. Really, I don't want politicians to be telling teachers what to do uh, from one parliament to the next. So I would like a greater degree of freedom for teachers to teach according to their professional skills in a diverse way, not the same everywhere in every school across the country. But I would like teachers to be considerably freer of politicians. Um, there's one thing, one project that I think helps, Teach First. I was a Teach First coach to three young teachers. They were really Seven. inspiring. And the number of teachers with good 2-1 degrees is increasing. On GPs, I just make one point. I'm married to a GP, and one of the things I notice is that revalidation is putting a real stress on GPs. I think we have to ask ourselves whether it's really helping us maintain the number of GPs in work that we need. Thank you very much indeed. Um, what I'll do is... Oh, there we are. Sorry. Jen Bailey Green. I do apologise. <laughs> Not because of your last... Yes. That's because you were first last time. Yeah, I do yeah. apologise. Uh, yeah, I mean, as, I said, as I think you mentioned anyway, so two-fifths of teachers actually quit within five years of taking up the, um, the profession, citing bad behaviour. A lot of it is really sort of... Chubbies at the moment, teachers are sort of teach to test, and it doesn't satisfy the teachers, and it's boring for the students in the end. We want to actually make schools actually fit for purpose and fit for actually the children, not the other way around. Um, regarding sort of public public services under stress, I mean, it's it's a main it's a main thing. I mean, obviously, sorry, I'm going, going back myself. I mean, the school system at the moment, I would say the academies. I don't think the academies work at all. That's why we want to go back to the comprehensive sort of style um, system. And it's sort of, it's, it's interesting actually, it's like this week, so like you say in the cuts, and it was, state, um, it was mentioned this week that Theresa May, Theresa May actually in, in the news today, that um, well, yesterday, that she's actually going to, there will be more cuts in the public sector. So the system at the moment isn't working. I think we need to sort of change that sort of side of it. Mm. Right. And there we are. Thank you very much indeed, candidates. I never realised how short a time two minutes was, but uh, <laughs> well done. It's a little bit like a program on Radio 4. Um, we've got uh, three questions then that I will bring together. I've had a very quick look at the slips that have come in and I think they mostly fit under the, the slightly sections we'll be we're talking at further down but if I have missed anything I'll try and fit that in towards the end. So the three questions I'm going to read out together um, are, are this and each Oh, I'm sorry, David, I should have given you a, a minute extra to respond if you wanted to respond to those. Yes, sorry, just the one minute, but um, I do apologise, jumping ahead of myself. Beginner. Uh, Winston Churchill said that uh, a lie can get halfway round the world before the truth has time to put its pants on. And um, the, the myth that the Conservatives uh, peddle about the financial problems of the country falls into that category. I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting graph, in fact, which I've got here, but it's probably almost impossible for any of you to see, which shows what was happening in terms of our recovery from the financial crisis caused by the, the banking collapse, which shows that the economy was growing on a very steep uh, graph like that until 2010, the middle of 2010 and then it suddenly dipped off again and the reason for that was because the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats decided to change strategy. They stopped stimulating the economy, they stopped investing and they put what was a recovery into reverse again. Just 10 had, seconds more please. Had they not done that our public services would not have been under the pressures that they were. Thank you very much David. I'm sorry I gave you a short moment there. Um, so, uh, the three questions that we're going to uh, provide together and then the candidates again will have two minutes whether they wish to 
identify one of those as their priority or try to cover all three of them is um, up to them, of course. Uh, so the first question uh, is about schools in Wickham. Upper schools in Wickham, and I understand that the hustings yesterday, there was quite a lot of coverage of some of the issues, so we're not going to go into as much depth on some of the subjects that have already been covered in some depth in previous hustings in order to try and get the breadth as possible. But this one um, hopefully is useful. Up, upper schools in Wickham are given the most difficult cohorts to teach. 50% of them are designated as requires improvement. Is it not fair for us to dramatically increase the budget for these struggling schools to help them cope with handling these difficulties? That's the first of three questions. As the second one, the, the next two are perhaps a bit closer to each other. Uh, with Britain's richest top 1% accumulating as much wealth as the poorest 55%, the source of that is ONS, and the richest 1,000 controlling 50, sorry, £547 billion pounds worth of wealth, a figure which has doubled over the past six years, how would you distribute wealth more evenly or would you choose not to? And um, a, a third question, why are there more than one million people being referred to food banks, especially when most of these people are actually in work? How did we get to this point? And what, if anything, should the government do about this situation? I'm going to keep the order the same for this question, if that's all right, David. I'm afraid that's two minutes, so you have to either choose, choose one or do the best you can with those. Um, David, are you happy to go first again? I'm afraid there isn't a one-minute response on this. So question one, um, one, of the, one of the easiest ways of um, spreading the load, as it were, is to introduce comprehensive education because, I mean, of course, the, the effect of the 11 plus is to take out the top slice of 25% uh, of the, the brightest students um, and to concentrate them in one part of the schooling system and leave the other 75% in the other part of the schooling system, which, of course, uh, as we know, um, does mean that those who come from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, those with English as an additional language, those with special needs, etc., are all concentrated in the upper schools rather than the, the grammar schools. And so a very easy way to actually spread the, the load is to spread the student population amongst all of our schools so that the brightest are educated uh, in, in a comprehensive system with the totality of the student body. Um, so that, that's an answer to that, which doesn't require actually financial input. Um, I, the other questions in, in terms of how do you distribute wealth more evenly, I, I mean, you have a, you have a fair tax system. I mean, under the, over the last five years, um, the inequalities in our country have grown. The poor have got poorer, the rich have got richer, the gap between rich and poor has got greater. We have uh, child poverty rates in Wickham, I mean, startlingly. Um, if you look at the statistics, 34% of children in Castlefield and Oak Ridge live in poverty. 32% in Disraeli, sort of mid-20% in Bowdoin. Uh, but then you go to the richer areas and you've got 9% living in poverty. I mean, that's a, that's a scandal, um, which we shouldn't allow. And, and having a fair tax system where, as I've said before, uh, those who are able to share uh, the load better, we, they do that. We get rid of non-DOM status. We tackle multinationals who fi uh, channel their funds into Luxembourg. Um, that's what we have to do. And uh, to have a food bank in Wickham... Ten uh, seconds, please. I mean, it's fantastic that Wickham people are so generous that they provide for those who are less fortunate than themselves, but they shouldn't need to. The pro one of the problems that we have um, with our um, economy and the work is that there are so many people who are in work but in poverty. I was talking to a guy the other day on That's Hatters Lane time, who's on a zero hours contract. He can't plan anything. One week he has lots of work, the next week he doesn't have any and he just can't plan. Thank you, David. Thanks very much. Uh, <coughs> David Meacock, UKIP, please. Uh, thank you very much. Well, the first, uh, first question on uh, upper schools. Um, well, first of all, I've always advocated the 11 plus for the simple reason that even in comprehensives, um, you'd have streaming. And it is a simple fact of life that those who tend to be more academically inclined are so because they naturally suck up the information like blotting paper. They've, for themselves, very often found the shortcuts to take that on board. Whereas those who aren't so academically inclined, perhaps because they're more practical, um, they're more sporty, um, everybody has different talents. 
um, they actually need a different type of teaching. They need to actually be taught the shortcuts that the more academically inclined just naturally seem to find for themselves. And one of the reasons I've always felt that the, the, the 11 plus or 12 plus as it was in my day, because um, there was a lost year at one point because of the uh, needing to manage the population bulge of the 60s. Um, one of the reasons I've always um, felt that the uh, 11 plus was, 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 a, was good was because it actually, sh the statistics show that the Bucks upper schools actually exceed the national average in their GCSE results. So the, the fact that, the, fact that uh, the average is exceeded, to my mind, shows that that system works. Um, the second question was really to do with the spread of wealth um, in terms of the increasing rich of the, uh, the top people getting richer and the bottom people getting poorer. That started under, of course, the Labour administration, um, most surprisingly, and has continued under the last coalition. Um, UKIP um, planned to spend some of the 100 billion we would save from spending money away and on abroad and HS2 Ten and the seconds. Barnett formula in giving tax cuts so that nobody on the minimum wage would be taxed at all. So we'd start off with a tax-free income of 13,000 a year. Thank you, David. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Steve Guy, Lib Dem. Thank you. Um, okay, well, first of all, to answer the, the question that was asked about upper schools, which was to do with funding, um, this actually dovetails with something that was um, a policy that I was arguing for in 2010 at this very venue, um, which I'm pleased to say was, was part of the coalition government uh, programme, which was something called pupil premium funding. Now, that means that we actually divert more funding to those schools that take uh, uh, pupils from less well-off backgrounds. Now, it might be no surprise to you that in Buckinghamshire that means that the money's going to the upper schools. And that tells you a little bit about one of the problems with, with 11 plus selection, which is that it tends to be, sadly, although it's meant to cause social mobility, it tends to be the children from the better off families that are more likely to get into the grammar schools. But it is something, yes, I agree with the question that we should give more money to the upper schools, and we do. Um, on the distribution of wealth, Beware socialism, okay, because that's the politics of envy. <coughs> what happened back in the 70s was that we had progressively higher and higher tax rates so that the very well-off in, in Britain were being taxed at sort of 80%. And then that led to something called a brain drain where our most talented people <coughs> went overseas. So it is very important, I think, to to help the people at the bottom of the tree and that's why again one of our policies was to in increase the tax threshold and continues to be so and we've increased it to over £10,000 in this, this part. 30 seconds. So it's really important to help the people uh, who are at the lower end who are working but are not retaining enough income to, 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 to adequately manage. Those are the people we need to help with tax breaks. I'm not convinced that you want to hit the very well off with, with punitive levels of tax because that just unfortunately is Ten going to seconds. encourage them to, to leave our country and, and take their wealth creation somewhere else. Thank you very much. Um, so, Steve Baker, Conservative. Thanks very much. In terms of school funding, we've made some progress towards fairer funding and the pupil premium is there to help those less advantaged. Um, I remember on wealth and equality, the 2010 campaign and the Labour candidate of the time lamenting that despite, in his words, if I recall correctly, the Labour government of the time having been the most redistributive we'd had, that wealth inequality had widened. Now there's something going on underneath our economy, something that is ruining it. And I've spoken about this since my maiden speech and all the way through the Parliament. For 44 years we've had a chronically inflationary monetary system. Now if you pour money into the economy, for example allowing it to triple as it happens between 97 and 2010, if you have an accelerating increase in the money supply as debt, you get all sorts of structural problems. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And I can't cover it all right now, but I believe this is a fundamental problem. I work on it often, and I secure support from across the political spectrum and around the world. And I'm going to continue to work on that particular issue, because I do think that wealth distribution in the country and in the world is unjust, and it's unjust because of a root problem, which is the way that money is created as debt in great floods, which go first on the whole to the rich. And I think that is a problem. I have to say, though, 
that the 1% have gone from paying 25% of income tax to 27%. If you want to see the distribution charts that accompanied the budget, you're welcome to come and have a look at them. They still show that this country redistributes from the rich to the poor. That is the way it works. Um, on food banks, the top two reasons that my office refers people, the lesser of them, is people not being able to work before they go to immigration tribunals. Well, maybe we should let them. And the other issue is that, from my office, the, the other issue is um, when people's circumstances change. The state's very bad at uh, recalculating benefits, and that needs to change. And the way to do it is universal credit, the minimum wage, a flourishing economy, and getting people into work, into better jobs with more investment, so that their real living standards can rise. Ben and that's, that is what I want to deliver, real living standards rising for everybody with a just and moral <coughs> social system based on sound economic policy, and that is what I will keep fighting for. Thank you very much. And Jen Bailey, please, Green. Yeah, as I mentioned um, previously, like the we, we are sort of in favour of the comprehensive system. Um, the trouble we see really with 11 plus is as children just feel pressurised into actually get, you know, to actually meet the demands that are put upon them on that one. The trouble, if they do fail, it just has an adverse effect on the rest of their schooling years. It's, you know, it's something that just doesn't work. Um, Running schools really as a business and making, making them school factories is just really wasting the child's potential and stifling the creativity on that one. Reference um, tax, tax evasion and stuff like that, it's, well, it's like tax really that is illegally evaded and legally avoided by um, exploiting loopholes is estimated at 120 billion per year. That's more than the um, deficit at the moment. Because services have the sort of their the favour or the the inclination is like if you actually favour the rich, it will trickle down. It's been proved that that isn't actually working to us. We, this is why we have this such this big divide in the rich and the poor, and um, and it's just not working. And the food banks, it's just a, you know, it's just actually shows that that is happening. Food banks in our day and age, it's a crime. It should not be happening. This is we shouldn't have this, and it's all down to the fact of the rise in inequality and uh, the differential between the rich and the poor. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you very much, gentlemen.